remember that we could say that the powerhouse as becoming the powerhouse for arts and culture and we spring forward from that from this from the cultural point of view. I don't think I can say any more than uh, the fact that uh, me as an elder, I've been honoured to uh, uh, give welcomes to uh, many people and I'm very happy to give uh, welcome to our honoured guest today. And might I say also, uh, in closing, that I speak as a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, an uncle to many. And my, uh, my great-grandchildren who revere me call me G.G. Bob, great-grandfather Bob. So <laughs> all those things are wonderful that make me a uh, part of the family and part of the family that you all enjoy yourself. So again, one year, one year, yari wa one year. Thank you, Uncle Bob, or Dr. Uncle Bob, I learned today. It's very impressive. Um, it's the first time I've actually prepared a speech while I've been speaking here at the Powerhouse. I normally just wing it. So it'll either go very well or very badly. Um, this seems like exactly the right occasion for me to tell an anecdote from my recent overseas trip. Don't worry, I promise I don't have any slides. Um, with some other folks here today, I spent a week in Edinburgh as part of the British Council Showcase, which just sounds very glamorous. While there, I was having a beer with William Burdett Coots, who runs the Assembly Rooms. He asked after how we'd been doing at Brisbane Powerhouse, and I, uh, I talked about how things had actually been pretty good. We'd been especially focused on Brisbane artists, and uh, we talked about how we'd grown opportunities over the last three years from uh, 324 to uh, 909 Brisbane artists being represented in our building last year. I wasn't looking, but that wasn't a, <laughs> a subtle, desperate cry for applause. Um, but what he actually said is, well, of course you would. And he said, well, look around here at Edinburgh. There's Circa and Cassis and Company 2 and Briefs Company. And the following week, uh, with a bunch of folks from QUT and, and others, I was in part of a delegation in Linz, Austria, for Ars Electronica. We are doing a, a lot more digital-based work here in the future. And I was telling about that to a mate there who runs the Brighton Digital Festival. I was just saying, uh, you know, thinking that was a really surprising and interesting thing to be telling him. And he sort of laughed and pointed out that while we were there at Ars Electronica, there were more Queensland artists than UK artists represented at that festival. So, speech over, I guess. Everything's going fantastic. We can all go to the bar. It all sounds great. Except, of course, there's a flip side to that. Only a few weeks before, I'm probably not meant to tell this story, Mitch, but I was a peer assessor for the Osco Theatre Panel. Um, and that time we had about 90 applications and we had three from the state of Queensland. And there were actually more Queenslanders attached to Victorian applications than there was Queensland applications. Around a similar time, many of us here would remember, we had an entire independent theatre company choosing to just move to Melbourne, joining a long, large and occasionally shameful history of people choosing to move down south to further their career in the arts. And these things, you know, Edinburgh on one hand, choosing to move to Melbourne on the other, that, that's sort of like, I think, part of a defining contradiction around the arts in Queensland. And I think that diaspora of artists is understandable to a degree. There isn't a single national centre or presenting company based in Brisbane. We have one peer peak body who's here today, Black Dance. Exactly what should have happened, well done. As a matter of fact, you Google uh, National Centre, the closest you get is the National Centre for Cricketing Excellence, which admittedly is very important in an Ashes year. Then there's the likelihood of funding support and having your work resourced. And I think we should perhaps get real about that for a second. Uh, according to a Crikey report, in the three years to 2013, there were 4,031 arts grants in total given out by the federal government. 1,693 of those went to just six electorates in inner city Sydney and Melbourne. Over the same period, 220 grants went to Griffith and Brisbane, the only Queensland electorates in double figures. So for those doing the math, that compares 42% of total funding with only 5.5%. 
those kind of stats come up, come up, come up a lot, come up a lot, a lot. According to a Culture Minister's report released last month, Queensland is 12%, about 12.6, I think. I read something similar in the Courier Mail today. Our federal arts funding, while as we all know, we're somewhere between 20 to 21% of the federal tax base. Per head, and it's not just a federal issue, per head our state government spends 18% less than New South Wales and Victoria and 27% less than the national average, making us the lowest of all states. Our local governments spend 12.5% less per head. So here's me, just another person in the arts complaining about funding, which is a bit of a cliche. But then why the success as well? How does that make sense? How can there be a circa or a shake and stir, probably Australia's most successful touring company? How do we overcome Queensland's decentralisation and tyranny of distance with our companies having a mandate to serve an entire state, not just a city? And that's so unique to hear. I saw Sandra and the Opera Queensland folks here. Um, and for those guys, the distance of taking a show from where we stand in Brisbane to Port Douglas is the equivalent of Opera Australia travelling from Sydney Harbour to the sub-Antarctic front. These are unique challenges. We have a government that is understandably pulled between supporting Brisbane and the regions as our population is split 50-50 between South East Queensland and our regional centres. But this is not a challenge that Victoria faces, where 90% of their population lives within 200 kilometres of the arts centre spire. Perhaps it's the moxie and suspicion of down south is what's helped us. A culture of we'll just do it ourselves, the wild west of wanting to do it the Queensland way. But equally, if some of those numbers and inequality were applied to gender, region, race, whatever you want to measure, we would look to a pathway to change. For Queensland, you could perhaps argue that hasn't happened. There's been a strategy of choosing not to have a strategy. But I hope we're heading towards opportunities to change that. To recognise, and I speak on behalf of Brisbane because I work in a place that has that city right in its name. We're a city here of 2.2 million people, larger than Paris, Prague and Philadelphia. And this city and this state requires cultural investment. In the spirit of hosting the National Centre for Cricketing Excellence, we need our playing field levelled. We need to address these numbers where Queensland trails all states. And we need things to be equitable, not just equal. Let me just add to that. I'm a firm believer in funding excellence and a great supporter of the Australia Council and the work it does for our nation and its culture, both here and overseas. But there is also part of me that thinks if we don't start with the same opportunities, how can you possibly judge what anyone creates in any fair way? This means we have to look to the entire arts ecosystem and consider our gaps. The lack of national companies, the only state without a funded theatre company for young people. Uh, our friends in the room in visual arts and music, I'm sure, can identify other gaps that exist. And this can't just be workshops on writing better grants. This needs to be an injection of resources to create opportunity. Opportunity will bring our artists back and keep them here, a thing our audiences deserve. Opportunity is a magnet for talent and that's why they've been drawn away. So I call to this room to offer up ideas today, questions, suggestions, and help us get closer to the answer. Those things that will stimulate the sector and highlight those things we're succeeding at. In the spirit of hosting the Commonwealth Games, I say it's time we stopped being forced to run uphill. Thank you. As well as the honour of introducing Uncle Bob, I also have the same to introduce the federal member for Brisbane, Trevor Evans. Uh, and this is not in my script, Trevor, but can I just say one thing personally? The stand that you've taken and the integrity you've shown around the question of marriage equality is something I have great respect for. And I think you showed a lot of leadership on that and real personal integrity, and I thank you for it. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, for your kind words as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon all, and thank you so much for coming. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Can I start by uh, thanking Uncle Bob for that great welcome to country and adding my acknowledgements to the traditional owners, the Turrbal and Yagra people. Uh, look, 
unlike Chris, I usually go into forums uh, with a prepared speech. Uh, and so for me, it's been the opposite way around today. Uh, I feel like I've been uh, enmeshed and emerged in this issue sufficiently, hopefully, to talk about it. But uh, just like Chris, this could go very, very well, or it could go very, very badly. Uh, uh, look, uh, uh, there's just a couple of things I guess I want to, to impart uh, today before I, I introduce the minister and call him up to the stage to say a few words. Uh, the first one is, you know, as a relatively new MP, I'm all of one year into this journey as the federal member here for Brisbane. It has been a huge privilege and a huge honour uh, to be able to get around to so many of the arts industry stakeholders, not just within the confines of my electorate, but across uh, the greater Brisbane and even broader uh, Queensland industry. Uh, I never needed converting in the first place, but I've had an incredible amount of uh, you know, fun along the way of engaging in, in this industry. I see huge potential and huge opportunities, and I'm very conscious from my conversations with Chris and from so many other people in the room about the uh, opportunities and the challenges that are in front of us here at the moment. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of context around what is a fairly uh, you know, conky and sensationalist article in the Courier Mail uh, today. Uh, you know, th there has been a broader piece of work at play with some of my Queensland colleagues and I in the space of the arts industry. And it's uh, not something that's happened uh, this week, although it is hopefully, you know, coming to a head as time goes by. This has been an area where a whole lot more work has been done. Uh, some of you who are political tragics might have noticed in previous terms of Parliament how uh, within governments, sometimes there's been this ability for uh, MPs and senators from particular states to band together and to get things, to achieve things, to call for answers uh, for issues that pertain to their states. That's something that naturally happens much easier for some of the other states than for Queensland. Uh, you mentioned the numbers for Victoria and Melbourne, for instance. It's a similar story in South Australia and WA, where most of the population is uh, you know, basically represented by the metropolitan areas. Queensland doesn't quite work like that. We do have the bulk of our population outside of of Brisbane and the, and the capital. Nonetheless, uh, my colleagues and I uh, in this government are very conscious of the fact that it is our numbers and our successes here in Queensland uh, that have led to the delivery of government for this government. Uh, and we are very, very keen to do everything that we can to work together uh, to address um, some issues, some challenges, and to grab some opportunities that we see in front of us. Our, our first foray as a team has been actually in the space of industry, def uh, defense industry. Uh, where we've done a lot of work together to try to get a very big Land 400 project based here in Queensland. It will be the equivalent of a mining boom, but without the boom bust uh, cycle, and it will be a huge thing for our economy if it manages to take place. Uh, the arts is right up there uh, as one of the other issues that unites us uh, as a team. And as was reported in the subtext of that article today, and I, I do apologize for the clunky language, but I don't apologize for having to use some colorful language to get a headline uh, in, a, in what is essentially a tabloid paper, no disrespect to the Korean Mail or other places. But uh, the, the point is, uh, there are 26 of us in the government as senators and members of parliament in this state. Uh, that is an incredible number, uh, far in advance as a proportion of most other states and territories. Uh, every single one of us. Uh, has signed uh, this letter to the Australia Council and, and to the Minister uh, asking questions, you know, no, not, not demanding anything, not stamping the feet. This is in the case of guns at 10 paces. It is at the start of what is going to be a naturally progressing conversation. Uh, and the question is, why, with 21% of the population, has Queensland traditionally only been receiving about 12 to 13% uh, of the national uh, discretionary funds that are handed out? This isn't a recent thing. It's not over one or five years or something. This has been an entrenched trend for an incredible amount of time. And uh, I've spoken to a lot of you already, uh, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of opinions as to how we got here, uh, why we are where we are, but more importantly, uh, where the future lies uh, with these issues. And so it's very much a case of kicking off that conversation, uh, finding the facts, isolating them, looking at the causes, uh, and then to the extent that we can, starting to remedy them. Uh, and so that's not, that's not a promise of a particular outcome, but uh, what I can strongly do is uh, commit to continuing to work very, very hard with all of you and uh, with my other colleagues uh, around Queensland who are just as passionate uh, about this cause and getting more for Queensland. So it's the start of a conversation, uh, you know, not the, not the end or, or, or halfway through, uh, but there's a long way to go and I look forward to working very, very hard with all of you on the way through. Uh, I just wanted to say, just in passing, uh, you know, it's fantastic to have the Minister here in Brisbane. Uh, I have uh, very consciously, uh, as a new MP, tried to get a number of ministers up here to Brisbane over the last year. Uh, and usually it's a case of having some little morning teas and afternoon teas and having a few industry stakeholders along. Uh, can I say, I am blown away 
uh, by the uh, interest that the Brisbane and Queensland arts industry has shown uh, in coming together to meet with the minister uh, to exchange stories and ideas and, and uh, to talk about things you know, constructively into the future. I'm just blown away by the attendance. This is fantastic. Uh, the only uh, you know, time that I've been uh, you know, in front of a crowd uh, this big uh, with as much excitement and trepidation was just the other side of this wall when I did my first Meet the Candidates night as a fresh-faced uh, candidate back, uh, back in the federal election. Uh, just, just finally, in closing, before I introduce uh, the minister, I, I just wanted to say, um, do take up the opportunity today, if, if not in terms of questions while we're up on stage, certainly in the afternoon tea afterwards, make sure you know you, you have your, your moments uh, with the minister and myself, get your point across. There are um, all sorts of uh, constructive ideas, a whole lot of information that really needs to be imparted uh, in a forum like today. And I just wanted to um, finish with this note. Uh, in Canberra, in this game of politics, just like uh, in, in your industry, stories matter. Uh, sometimes the stories that each of you have experienced and you can impart today uh, leave an indelible mark, a memory, an experience that is much easier to pass on to my colleagues and to the government uh, in Canberra uh, than any amount of policy, uh, you know, facts and information and statistics. So take this opportunity, tell your stories. Thank you so much for all coming along and being a part of today. And it gives me great privilege, uh, great honour uh, to introduce the Minister for Communications and the Arts, Senator Mitch Fifield. Well, thanks very much indeed, and uh, thanks, Uncle Bob, for your uh, welcome to country. Greatly appreciated. Uh, and thank you, Trevor Evans, for organising this magnificent forum. Uh, Trevor has been an absolute breath of fresh air uh, in Canberra. Uh, he's uh, passionate about the arts. Uh, it's one of uh, the great causes uh, that he champions. Uh, and as uh, you saw in the Courier Mail today, uh, he is no shrinking violet. So, Trevor, congratulations and thank you. Um, it's uh, great to be here, uh, particularly uh, during the Brisbane Festival. Uh, and also uh, tomorrow uh, we have a gathering of the, uh, the Culture Minister's Council where the arts ministers from uh, around uh, the nation come together. So uh, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity uh, to be with you today. Uh, I am going with Trevor tonight uh, to uh, the Octoroons um, with the Queensland Theatre, uh, mainly because uh, my life wouldn't be worth living uh, in terms of Sue if I didn't go. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, at the outset, uh, I just want to make a, a few comments uh, about how I see the arts, how I know Trevor sees the arts. Uh, and that is, uh, we believe in art for art's sake. Uh, we believe uh, in the inherent uh, value uh, and virtue of uh, the creative process. Uh, and I want to say very clearly uh, that uh, from where I stand, uh, the arts are not a luxury. Uh, they're not some add-on. They're not something extracurricular. Uh, the arts are core to who we are as individuals. And the arts are core to our society. That uh, through what you do uh, and uh, what those you work with do. Uh, you help us to make sense of the past, uh, you help us to understand the present, uh, and you help us to be much better prepared for the future. And something I think that we don't stop and pause and reflect upon enough is that uh, the arts are one of the fundamental underpinnings of freedom of speech. Uh, that we want the arts to uh, be confronting, uh, we want the arts to be challenging, uh, we want the arts sometimes uh, to be embracing and comforting, uh, but we also want the arts to be disturbing and confronting. And we don't have true freedom of speech unless the arts is making its contribution in that way. And it also is worth pausing and thinking uh, and recognising that in doing that, in making that contribution, uh, it is one of the underpinnings of having a robust and pluralistic democracy. If you look at nations around the world um, who don't have a, a vibrant culture, uh, who don't have a, a vibrant uh, artistic life, 
uh, they're usually the nations who also have fairly weak democracy. Uh, so I, again, I think that's, uh, that's just something that is worth us uh, pausing and reflecting upon. Now, none of that uh, is in any way inconsistent with recognising that uh, the arts are at the beating heart of uh, an important part of our economy, uh, the arts and the creative industries. Uh, the people who are employed, uh, the work that is created, uh, the industries that are supported. Uh, that is something very important uh, that this uh, sector does. Uh, and again, I don't think we recognise enough uh, that contribution to our economy. You would all be well aware uh, of the architecture which we have in place federally uh, for the arts. Uh, we have uh, the Australia Council. We have Creative Partnerships Australia. Uh, we have our great national collecting institutions. Uh, we have uh, our great national training schools, which are the prime area of uh, Commonwealth involvement. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, the major performing and uh, arts organisations framework which is uh, shared between uh, the Commonwealth and the states. And there was uh, a change to that um, uh, in an earlier part uh, of uh, the government that, that I'm a member and you'd all well recall uh, the establishment of uh, the Catalyst Fund. And when I came into the portfolio uh, I said that uh, I wanted to stop, I wanted to listen and I wanted to learn. Uh, from uh, the people in this room and the people uh, beyond this room. Uh, I did stop, I did listen and I did learn uh, and as a result uh, that catalyst funding was returned to the Australian Council. And the reason I did that was because the message came through loud and clear. Uh, the regard uh, that uh, that organisation is held in as an arm's length uh, funding body uh, standing next to but separate from government. And the message came through loud and clear uh, that what the sector wanted was certainty uh, in terms of, uh, of that framework. Now, uh, I did that uh, and uh, I hope it has uh, given some, some greater certainty. The mantra that I have as, as a minister in the portfolio is that while in one sense as the minister I'm a steward of the arts, uh, I'm also a student of the arts. And I'm a student because uh, I'm not the person who has the expertise. Uh, the people who have the expertise uh, are those who are sitting in this room. So the best ideas uh, and the really good ideas and the path for the future uh, will ultimately uh, come from you uh, and your colleagues around the nation. Now, I want to touch briefly on uh, what has been well articulated today, uh, and that is uh, Queensland. Uh, at its place and its funding uh, in, uh, in comparison to other jurisdictions. As you know, the Australia Council uh, is uh, uh, arm's length from government, uh, which means their funding decisions are uh, taken separately. And therefore, uh, it is right and proper that the Australia Council give an account of themselves for the decisions that they take, uh, for the structures that uh, they have internally, uh, and for the assessment processes. And can I give credit to, uh, to Trevor uh, for uh, putting that on the map uh, with his Queensland colleagues. Uh, as Trevor said, a lot of work has been done by Queensland colleagues uh, and uh, it did uh, find expression in the Courier Mail today. So what I would love to hear uh, from you today, are your ideas uh, as to what should be the architecture uh, of the Commonwealth Arts portfolio and those areas where you think uh, the government, the executive government, uh, should seek to be involved to have a different architecture. Because on the one hand, we've got an arm's length body. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, the community in this room saying that uh, different outcomes would be good, that Queensland should be getting uh, its fair share. So um, what I really, really want, and I know what Trevor wants, is uh, your ideas as to how that can be given effect to. Um, I do just want to observe um, when I did return uh, Catalyst funding to the Australia Council, 
uh, I did take the opportunity to address what were, I thought, a couple of Queensland anomalies that uh, needed uh, some quick um, addressing. And one of those was uh, to uplift the money for the Queensland Ballet. Um, we all know Lee does a, a fantastic job. Uh, and so we've uplifted over the, the next four years uh, to an extra $960,000 for the Queensland Ballet. Also, um, the uh, Opera Queensland, uh, we know, has had some issues. Uh, and so I was keen to put some money towards uh, helping uh, that company uh, get on its feet and into a sustainable position. But one of the reasons I did that with both those organisations was to be uh, a statement that I recognise that uh, there is more uh, that's needed for Queensland and I wanted that to be a practical demonstration. So uh, I am here today uh, more than anything, uh, not to talk to you, uh, not to uh, give you the Mitch view of the world, uh, but to uh, hear from you um, as how we can best shape uh, the architecture for the arts and uh, how we can best support Queensland. So uh, Trevor and I are in your hands. Uh, we look forward to, to uh, your wisdom. Uh, we look forward to your suggestions. Uh, and we look forward uh, to uh, working with uh, and for you to uh, deliver some better outcomes for this state. Thanks very much. Mm. Hi folks, I'm Fiona Maxwell, I'm the CEO here at Brisbane Powerhouse, uh, and I get to be the kind of convener of the questions um, today and comments and ideas and initiatives and all of that sort of thing. Um, what I should make mention of is a real welcome to our regional participants who are here today. And it's nice to be able to see their faces as much as they can uh, <laughs> see yours. Um, so what's really important is that any interveners be spoken into a microphone so that they can understand what's going on as well. And we'll also take some questions from, um, some, from some of our other participants as, as we go. So, um, these guys are, are, are very brave, um, ready to stand in front of a group of, uh, of the arts sector and, uh, and, and you know, have a, a little bit of a chat. But I think it'd be really great to start, as they, as they suggested, with some real um, insights into the sort of strengths and, and opportunities here in, in Queensland um, and, and some of the things that, um, that you feel that, that these guys can take back to Canberra as stories. So, um, it, anyone, anyone ready to... Uh, have some insights, thoughts? In the, yep, in the front row or second front row. Hello, my name is Angie Andrews. I'm an international award winning author of several books. I'm also a producer and director of a TV show called Healthy Living with Aloe Vera. I'm also a single mother of four and I'm struggling very, very hard to get funding. Um, uh, the latest. My latest book is also what the, the TV show is all about. And trying to get funding for the show has been incredibly hard. Um, my business partner and I have made four episodes. We, um, I have gone everywhere. We've got a distributor who's interested in, in um, taking it to the TV stations, but they want 13 episodes. So going from four episodes to 13 on no budget, and no finance on nothing, it has been extremely hard. So we've only been able to make four so far. Um, at the moment, we're really, we've tried everywhere. I, I think we've tried um, 14 different fund, um, funding, government funding things and have been knocked back on everything. Maybe we say it the wrong way, I don't know. <laughs> but it's been extremely frustrating. And especially when you've got something you know that's going to not only give more employment to your area, it's going to promote um, South East Queensland in an awesome way. It's also going to help the health issues of everybody in the world because it will, like the Australian government promotes with five veg, two fruit, we promote the most important thing to a healthy body is a strong, healthy immune system and it works. We've seen thousands of people who have been told they haven't had much, they, they don't have much hope for their health. They've tried this type of natural eating and drinking and they've gained better health enough to get operated on and get better again. This isn't a cure, it's a way of helping people help their health issues. Um, 
all my friends that have been trying this over the flu season, they've had the flu for three days. Most people have had the flu for five days or, or five weeks. Or they've had it for a lot longer because they haven't strengthened their immune system. And but, uh, but I was just going to say, that's, we might sort of focus that on the art side of things. It sounds sure. like a really realistic... Uh, uh, this is art uh, 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 a 3D um, yeah. stuff in the, in the um, TV show. I mean, it, it's a lot of artistic work and it involves a lot of people that we would like to employ. But you know, trying to get the funding to get it out there is not easy. I'll, I'll just make a, a few a few observations, which which may be may be helpful. Um, I guess with, with any uh, any funding programs, uh, they're always competitive. Uh, there's always a percentage of people who uh, who are unsuccessful. Uh, so uh, you know, that is to some extent the the, the nature um, of of this uh, this environment. Uh, two suggestions. One is uh, there are a number of uh, preventative health foundations uh, who uh, look to commission works to uh, meet their objectives. Uh, there are uh, philanthropic trusts, again, uh, who are open to, uh, to good propositions. But also, um, I think it's, it's really good uh, if you can find a mentor, someone who, who works in your industry, um, who works as an independent producer for these sorts of programs, um, who can uh, give advice as to some of the things that have worked for them and uh, some of the pitfalls that uh, they've avoided. Thank you. Oh, very good. <laughs> I just, I, actually, before you jump in, I should, I should actually just say, it's, it's really fantastic range of people that we've got in the room. Um, and I think we've, you know, we've got a real representation of, of different organisations, art forms, um, the opera and the ballet that were, were mentioned. Um, through to independent producers and artists. And, and so it's going to be great to get lots of um, suggestions and ideas. Hello. My name's Hi. Marinda Dunley. I work for Black Dance, the national peak body for Indigenous dance. As you know, the success of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art comes from our cultural practices. Our art is a byproduct of our culture. For thousands of generations, our people have been self-determining our own cultural futures. My question is, what is your position on self-governing Indigenous arts and culture within a new arts and culture policy framework? Th thank you. <laughs> I think this is an area that uh, the Australia Council is, is looking at and in their most recent corporate plan, uh, they, they talk about the, the possibility, I think they refer to it as, as an authority, uh, which would be um, uh, an authority uh, which was uh, in Indigenous um, run uh, and uh, would have a commissioning role. Uh, Sounds like a you know an extremely good idea to me. It's it's something it's a concept uh, that's only relatively recently been been put to me, uh, but it's it's one that the Australia Council is keen to pursue. Uh, I think Rupert Ma, as uh, as chair, is looking to be a, a, a champion. Um, I know uh, Leanne Buckskin, um, who's the deputy chair of the Australia Council, um, who's a fabulous person, um, is is also really passionate. Uh, so. I, I, I like it in concept, um, and I'm keen to see what, what I can do to support the Australia Council in pursuing. Mm. And can I just uh, just add as well, I think it's a conversation I'd love to have with some of my Queensland colleagues. I can think of a few of them, such as uh, uh, Warren Ench, who represents uh, the, the Cape and Torres Strait, who, uh, who probably has some pretty good uh, experiences, connections and thoughts along those lines as well. So let's, let's, let's grab that conversation and uh, share it amongst my colleagues. And, yeah, see but, where it goes. It'd but it, you're right. it, it is a missing piece at the moment. Fantastic. Excellent. Oh, Pat in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Do I need to stand? I'm Catherine Quigley. I'm the CEO of Backbone New Hearts, which is here in Brisbane. I'm also one of the inaugural cohort for the NIDA Masters of Cultural Leadership. So thank you for this talk. Um, we've seen a shift away from dedicated investment for children and young people as creators and collaborators of arts and culture in their own right. 
The Chamber for uh, the Queensland Chamber for Arts and Culture recently completed a sector survey across the state, and 86% of respondents indicated that um, children and young people is a huge priority in the arts. What is your advice to improve the situation for children and young people's equal access to creating arts and culture? No, th thanks. And uh, <clears throat> I think when um, when the money was removed from uh, the Australia Council uh, for the Catalyst, and I think even even before that, uh, with some of the re restructuring that happened in the Australia Council, uh, there was what looked to be a, a reduction in the amount of support for for theatre you know, by and for young people. I guess that's that's an example of where. Um, I'd be interested in, in what you think as to whether the government should in some way um, mandate to the Australia Council that there should be you know, a certain proportion um, of their funding that goes towards you know, works you know, by and for kids, um, if there should be mandated um, you know, proportions that go to each jurisdiction to ensure that there's um, an equitable share. Um, to date, um, under successive governments, the approach has been essentially that the government of the, of the day will um, appropriate the money to the Australian Council, it will appoint the board members, and then that's it. Um, it's you know, respecting the independence of the Australian Council over to them and, and the peers uh, and the board. So I, I'm interested to the extent to which um, you and, uh, and and your colleagues think think that um, there should be a still the Australian Council being independent, but the extent to which there should be a more of a detailed framework within which they operate. I I think one of the key pieces that's currently missing is a policy for children and young people, which actually demonstrates those mm. kinds of guidelines and frameworks. Um, there used to be one, which is where the program Youth Arts Fund sort of fell under, and then we saw Arts Start and a whole bunch of yep. funding programs for um, young people and independent artists and fall within that category mm -hmm. and be guided by that. Um, and that, that sort of structure has changed within the Australian Council. Yep. So, whether that's something that is a wider conversation we can have just not. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask as well, just just while you have the microphone, uh, uh, I assume um, you know. Well, I, you never want to assume, but um, uh, do you want to expand a little bit on maybe some of the challenges that uh, younger artists would have accessing funding, given some of the you know the application processes and the and the bureaucracy and so on involved? It's a leading question like for some of the things I'd like to say later. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I here's some I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, would any of you like to respond? Who are here? Yeah. We have some young people in the audience. Actually, Actually got real Speak ones. up, speak yeah, up. Real young people, which is great. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Yeah, throw it in the deep end. Um, I suppose as a young person in the arts, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to work for free. And I feel like it's a big expectation until you're about 30 that you're going to just be a volunteer. And it's a pretty unsustainable practice I've experienced. Um, and I just think... It's about looking towards organisations that already exist and opportunities exclusively for young and developing artists. And I think, um, yeah, it, it's especially fantastic to be brought here by CAP and to be included in this conversation because I think it is there's a lot of limited opportunities for young people and it's not a particularly sustainable career path at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, as someone who, hi, my name is Johnny. Um, uh, as someone who was within the industry for about four years um, and then continually uh, struggling trying to build something of a career uh, within the arts, um, I had to take a step back because um, there was just a lot of free work, but then the paid work that was available, um, it was always going to someone who is like an older demographic um, because I guess they paid their dues. Um, but then how, how do people under 30 sustain a career within the arts when there is no support framework to pay rent? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that's Can what I... we are continually struggling with. So what happens is mm. that you end up with an industry full of people who have the privilege and access to working in the industry and the lack of diversity of voice. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but the, the lights have come on in my mind as well. <laughs> Uh, can, can I pick up on just a, a couple of things uh, there? I think Chris mentioned in his earlier comments that I think one of the aspects of Queensland sort of, you know, uh, trends of lower per capita funding on a few different levels have possibly, uh, you know, come about as, as, a, as a natural consequence of there possibly being a lower number of, of applications and, and possibly some, you know, um, quality um, comparisons in those applications. Uh, as well, I know that uh, in many years go by, or I understand many years ago, uh, the Australia Council and other institutions used to have people up here actively sort of based in Queensland to assist people to go through those sorts of processes. I think that there is possibly a, uh, you know, a skilling question here. There's absolutely no doubt. I see it across other industries as well. Knowing how to work within frameworks to make uh, applications, uh, you know, when you're, when you're working on your own independently, it is its own skill set and it's a different set of skills to the artistic and creative skills that you want to focus on. It's a business-like sort of skills where, uh, you know, we probably can do more to both have a strategy uh, and to support those people. So I see, I see a few hands going up. And yeah, so I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for those stories. And I just also wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned in the, uh, the question as well. Uh, can I encourage everybody in the, industry, in the industry to get together behind this idea of a chamber to represent the industry's interests uh, broadly, as as somebody who uh, comes from an industry uh, organisation background, I spent some years in charge of the retail association. I know the strength of speaking as much as you possibly can with one voice, even when there are a lot of disparate interests. There, you know, the big and the small, and the collaborative and the independent. The things that unite you will inevitably be larger than the things that divide you. Now I know the hands. So many organisations. We've got a whole lot of other. Hang on, hang on a sec. I know the hands are going crazy, but we've got some folks uh, regionally that have kind of had hands going virtually for a little while. So, we'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> Scotia. Oh, here we go. Um, hello, Minister. Good to see you. Uh, nice to see you again. Oh. And oh. I'm Melissa from Arts Nexus, based in Far North Queensland. We've had a great start for regional investment with the last state budget and the opportunity to remodel the delivery of regional arts. The Queensland Chamber of Arts and Culture proposed a state government for a $5.5 million per year investment for a whole of state. The budget allocated $5.5 million over four years. So you can see this is quite a short form from what was recommended as optimal. Are you prepared to take the lead as Federal Minister to coordinate the key stakeholders, the Ministry of the Arts, Australia Council, Regional Arts Australia, Arts Queensland and the sector to create an innovative delivery of sustainable investment for regional communities that could potentially be replicated nationally? Did you, did you catch all of that? I, I did. Yeah. And out. I, I did. And thank you. This, this is something that uh, we've uh, we've discussed uh, before. Um, I, I do think that uh, we do need to have a, an enhanced focus on the arts in, in regional Australia. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I appointed to the the board of the Australia Council, uh, Kate Fielding, uh, who is the chair of uh, Regional Arts Australia, based in, in Kalgoorlie, uh, because. The Australia Council as a board, I think, needs to constantly have regional Australia uh, in its frame and, and in its mind. Um, and there is uh, you know, sometimes um, the, the, the erroneous uh, view that uh, you know, the arts are really something that uh, is alive and well in, uh, in metropolitan areas, uh, that it's not the case in, in regional areas. But you, know, you, you all know that, that the arts is, uh, is thumping and thriving uh, in regional Australia, and uh, uh, you know, not long back, uh, I visited uh, in Lismore, in New South Wales, a fantastic uh, theatre company called Norpa, who uh, commission original works, uh, and people just wouldn't assume that they would just assume that you don't have original works that are commissioned in, in regional areas. Uh, so th there is there is more uh, to do uh, in terms of uh, the, the regions, uh, and again, this is. Um, I guess another another example where uh, 
what should the role of the executive government be? The bulk of arts money federally is within the Australia Council. So if there's a view that there need to be different priorities uh, for how that money is allocated, uh, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, one is to say, Australia Council, this is our petition. Uh, we think you should do things differently. The other is to say, well, actually, we think the executive government should intervene in, in some way uh, to, to make that happen. So this is a really fundamental discussion about the architecture of the arts at federal level. Uh, do we, and, you know, I'm ultimately in your hands, um, do, we, do we want the federal government to say, this is the way that the Australian Council, in broad terms, should structure what it does? Or do we want to have that conversation direct with the Australian Council to have them uh, alter their approach? So I think, I think that's an interesting question to, to put back to the audience. That, that's right. But perhaps to do a straw poll, mm. um, a show of hands, and I'm sure everyone's got a yes but. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in either to leave things where they are, where the Australian Council sets the tone, um, and then I guess the alternative is where we ask the government to weigh in on some of these issues where we're not feeling that things are being heard. So leave it the way it is. Any, any show of hands? That's too simple. Too simple. Yeah, Melissa? Uh, yeah, the question really is about who is going to take the leadership because it is confusing and it seems like none of the players are all together. Then the sector is calling at the other end to actually uh, talk about the model to put forward rather than actually working together to put the model together. So, yeah, we're in a great moment to be able to get this right. But it seems that no one's taking the actual lead. Well, by law, and this is the way the Australian Council is set up, I cannot direct them how to allocate their money. I can't direct them in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the distribution or, or the structure, that's, that's the way that this is established. Um, so we, we, we have the situation where people say, we want the Australian Council to be arm's length and independent, but Minister, can you have them spend more money here, more money on that? Can you have a, an equitable balance between jurisdictions? And, and that's the issue is, if it's arm's length, it's arm's length. Um, you can overlay on that, there would be mechanisms to do this, overlay on that some, some broad parameters uh, over how that arm's length allocation should occur. And I guess that's really the, really the question that, uh, that I'm putting to the, yeah. to the room. All right, well, um, who's, got, who's got the mic? David, have you got one there behind Chris? Minister, Minister if the Australia Council had its budget returned to a Sorry, since, since Keating, the Australia Council has been losing money in real terms. If the Australia Council's budget was increased, then they would be able to address some of these issues because they are in a situation where the pressure of the heritage companies, and you yourself were obviously were um, pressured beautifully to get more money to the Queensland Ballet and the, and the Queensland Opera, not to young people's companies, not to digital art, not to visual art, not to um, contemporary music. It's always been that the heritage arts have a much stronger pull on governments of both persuasions. But if the Australia Council had more money, you would probably find that that actually cover more areas better. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well with, with the Queensland Ballet, that was an example where the state relativity argument was put to me. Look at how this Queensland company is comparing compared to um, other uh, companies in, in, in other states. So that was, that was where, where that particular uh, uh, issue arose. Um, uh, sure, um, I, think, uh, I think every everyone in this room and uh, there, there wouldn't be an arts minister uh, who uh, wouldn't wish uh, that they could increase uh, the allocation to uh, the Australia Council uh, and for the arts uh, more broadly. Uh, we do, this is, this is just a fact of life, uh, where we do operate in uh, constrained uh, budget um, times. But even if, even if the 
the budget of the Australian Council, let's just say you know, it increased by, by 10%, um, we would still be having this discussion even then about, um, about youth, uh, youth theatre. Uh, we would still be having this discussion about uh, Queensland's relative allocation compared to other jurisdictions. Um, this is still a discussion that would need to be had uh, even if uh, the Australian Council's budget was increased. So, yes, we'd, we'd all like that to happen, but that isn't going to solve the structural issues uh, which are raised with me uh, every day. Mm. Can I just add a couple of comments just on, yeah. on the way through? So, you know, from, from, from the perspective of Queensland compared to other uh, states, which, you know, is, is top of mind for some of my colleagues here in Queensland, you know, the difference that we're talking about does run into the tens, well, not, not, not tens, of, but millions and millions of dollars in terms of annual funding that you'd expect Queensland to get that it currently isn't, and obviously that's a significant amount. But I did just want to pick up on something that Mitch said. Uh, my experience as a new uh, MP is, is very much along these lines, uh, probably two to three times uh, a day, people tell me about how lots of different things could be much better off if only uh, you know I could secure somebody a few million dollars. Two million dollars almost always seems to be the typical amount I'm asked for, about two or three times a day. But ju but just to give you an idea of the sorts of you know d the demands and the expectations, often that's in spaces like um, you know medical research and pharmaceuticals. Often it's in spaces like you know, the environment or, or education or, or something like that. There are some general constraints there around budget, which is our, our inevitable challenge, and we're up for that, um, of course. Um, it, some of these things, some of these specific challenges, though, that have been named, uh, you know, the, the uh, political solution uh, is for us to get some backing behind some of these challenges and some of these opportunities that we see so that the, the questions are asked and the conversation uh, is had. Uh, because in the absence of that, uh, you know, nothing, nothing will change. Uh, discussion. We went perhaps one more regionally, and then we, we might keep scattering around the room. We've got about sort of another fifteen minutes, so I want to get as many more from each perspective as we can. So, Kerry Ann, if you want to respond, sorry, you just have to unmike. Uh, thank you, Kerry Ann from Flying Arts Alliance. Um, uh, I, just to reiterate uh, the question uh, from Melissa, um, are there other ways that uh, the Minister can see that leadership can be um, delivered in the context of regional arts uh, so that we can bring stakeholders together to have discussions at one table? rather than um, decisions being uh, taken down the line. And just to look at whether there's ways to get policy uh, from the, the, the minister on a federal level for regional arts. Mm. Well, I guess I can, I can have a range of policies, um, but if they aren't given effect to via the Australian Council, then they're just words, words on, a, on paper. Um, so we come back to, uh, what do we want the role of the Australian Council to be? Now, there are obviously separate to, to the Australian Council, there's a, a relatively small uh, number of programs which are um, administered by my, by my department. Um, and that there are some that, that relate to regional arts. So I think in practical answer to your question, um, why, why don't I, commit now that uh, I will have a, a regional arts forum annually, uh, which, uh, which will have an, a different regional centre, uh, so that uh, there is dedicated time each year uh, when regional arts organisations can get together with, with me as the Minister. Minister <laughs> Sally Chair of Office of Queensland. I think because of the very decentralised nature of Queensland, uh, one of the things that Queensland art companies and organisations do so well is innovation and collaboration. We have to because it's the only way that we can support the arts and present the arts throughout Queensland. And I think that there would be extraordinary stories for you to hear from my colleagues in the room about 
just how well Queensland does innovation and collaboration. And I'll just give you two very quick examples from our perspective, but there will be many more. Um, we collaborate with all sorts of organisations, including, for example, Shaggy Stir Theatre Company, who with us will take a regional tour for primary school children, 30,000 primary school children in the Sydney Valley for the next 12 months. And a couple of years ago, when our funding was so tight, we were worried about how we were going to share opera with Queenslanders. We realised we couldn't take our chorus on the road on a regional tour, so we trained up community choruses everywhere we met who sang the chorus parts of major operas, and it's been fantastic for those communities. But I think the stories of collaboration and innovation in this room would really impress you. Yeah. And finally, we have a chief scientist in Australia. We have lots of chief thinkers. And given that the arts is critical for a vibrant, diverse, inclusive society, we need a chief artist. <laughs> We, 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 could, we could have a, a poet laureate uh, sitting alongside <laughs> as well, but uh, I, I, I like that. Um, and I, I just love that example of, of uh, uh, having uh, local you know, community choruses uh, to, to back the work. Um, I, mean, I, I think it's a fabulous example because there's, there's always a, a, a danger when you've got major performing arts companies going into the regions that it, you know, it can feel a bit like a, you know, sort of a, a missionary venture. Um, uh, and you know, the more that um, the more that uh, you know that the major companies can can do things that that actually you know integrate with the local community, have them feel this isn't a group from the from the city coming to us. You know, we're part of this this whole experience. I mean, I I just think it's that's terrific. Can I add just a couple of comments? Uh, uh, amongst you in in this room, I have very deliberately invited some representatives of uh, Brisbane's uh, uh, growing digital and creative uh, arts scene. And, and the reason that I've done that is I actually see it as a, you know, a niche and growing focus for Brisbane. Uh, not many people know, but the skills that we have in this city are leading the world in places like virtual reality, uh, when the uh, you know, Japanese want to create advertisements and uh, you know, fairy creatures and things in a new age sort of way, they actually turn to Brisbane companies and Brisbane skills for that talent. And, uh, one of the things that I hope comes out of not just this conversation and the afternoon tea afterwards, but, you know, uh, shake the hands of the people next to you, uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, there's a lot of great talent in this place, uh, including some great potential partnerships and collaborations, which I'd love to see happen. So thank you. Right. Um, I think we've got some five minutes to just grab a few more and it'd be great to, for the Minister to sort of finish with some of the great positive anecdotes of what's yeah. going on here heading to the Cultural Minister's Council tomorrow to label it to kind of battle can. And then we'll, um, we'll finish with um, Catherine from the Chamber to sort of to wrap. So, um, where are we, Joe? Sorry, you've been waiting for a while. Thank you. Sorry, I'm hiding behind here. Uh, I'm Joe Thomas. I'm the Creative Director of Metro Arts here in Brisbane. As I left the building over in the CBD, we had 60-odd artists who were there, squirrelled away. They're all working. They're there every single day. And I will just reiterate that these independent artists don't get paid a lot of the time. And I want to see their voice represented in culture and represented in policy that you need to understand as well. Mm -hmm. That it's not just our wonderful operas and our wonderful ballet, but contemporary arts not are the either. arts of the future. Mm -hmm. And they are the arts of our young people. So I make this appeal to you on behalf of them because they are wonderful and they are the feeders of our arts and culture. They go into these organisations. I would like to offer a suggestion. If we need more money, is there a way that federally we can look at taking just a percentage of development money, a percentage of gambling money, and committing that to the arts. It's done around the world. Why isn't it done here? Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on board. Uh, gambling revenues go to the states. Um, so if there's a percentage to be had there, um, we, can, we, can, we can raise it with them tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's a good action to take with you. Uh, I'll go back next Chris. Hello there. Hi, my name, my name is Stu Waters. Uh, I represent the Australian independent recording industry. Um, we recently commissioned a report from Deloitte where uh, we represent 30% market share in independent artists 
actually pulled out about 90% of new releases each year. Um, in Queensland, and specifically, we don't actually receive a great deal of funding out of that contemporary uh, music allocation. It's around about the 11%, so it's even further down the line. Mm -hmm. Just thought I'd point that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, at federal level, I'm interested, uh, the independent recording sector doesn't always, although it is uh, nurturing and developing those artists, it doesn't actually get um, a great deal of access to funds to help them develop those artists themselves because of the, the nature of the business that they operate. They are small businesses mm. working in the arts sector. What sort of uh, role can the federal government play in terms of creating linkages between uh, the arts community and other uh, departments? What sort of bridging uh, relationships can you build, particularly around innovation, particularly around export, particularly around uh, small business? Mm. Uh, thanks. Um, th there are a range of um, range of programs that uh, sit in the in the industry portfolio and in the trade portfolio, which aren't designed to be sector specific, uh, but are there for a range of, of small businesses across sectors to help them with uh, with, with exports, uh, to help them uh, as small businesses that are that are starting up. So uh, there are certainly those those programs there, but. I think from what you're saying is is that there, there's not a close enough connection between the the art the Commonwealth Arts bureaucracy let's call call it that for, for want of a better phrase um, and and the recording industry that they they're seen as they're doing okay you know their businesses are good luck to them but that there's not that that connection and understanding between the two so yeah let, leave that with me we'll take that on board thank you. Look, I think we've probably got time for just one more, um, and then there'll be plenty more time for conversation out, outside. I know, Pat, you've been waiting since right at the very beginning. <laughs> Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Pat Swell. I'm the Chief Executive of Access Arts. We work with people who experience t t disability or d disadvantage across Queensland. Um, we have some amazing success stories. Our artists are now exhibiting at KPMG at the private view. 70% of their artwork was sold. Um, yes. Um, the, um, um, through our workshop program, our artists finished up dancing with members of, of, of the Royal Ballet at Cupac. Um, we've recently um, just finished a pilot scheme in Townsville in partnership with uh, the Cerebral Palsy League and Dance North, looking at the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, now, the costings for the National Disability Insurance Scheme show that the artists are not paid sufficiently for these workshops to continue. We've done a lot of work um, research um, across the country and um, as I say looking at Townsville to see how we can try and make these figures work. We've worked extensively with the non-profit sector. So tomorrow I imagine you are um, talking um, about the delivery of the National Arts and Disability Strategy um, and we work to um, help and support the delivery of the National Arts and Disability Strategy, a federal government initiative. Yeah. But the federal government under the NDIS is going to stop arts yeah. programs happening across the country because the price guide is not giving a sufficient uh, price level for artists. I would very much like you, Mitch, and you, Trevor, to take that back and to look and see what can be done. Is this the same government which has a national arts and disability strategy, but is yet cutting off people through the national um, disability insurance scheme? I have the evidence of the social impact of the work that we do of how with the dance program, for example, the um, medical and health benefits in terms of developing motor skills, balance, memory. I have that evidence of the benefits of what we do. No, Please can I ask you to take this back and to um, look at this McKinsey 
um, is actually doing a pricing review. So um, now is the most important time. I, I will definitely take that uh, back and in fact uh, I would like to set up a little conversation between yourself, myself and my parliamentary neighbour Jane Prentice who's the Assistant Minister for Disabilities and she represents the Western Burbs of Brisbane and um, she, is, she has been a passionate contributor amongst my colleagues to bringing this together in this conversation so I think she'll be very, very keen to have that talk with you. And, and, and can I just, just add... Um, uh, my incarnation before being the Communications and the Arts Minister was Minister for Disabilities and Aged Care. Um, so I, I had uh, stewardship of uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme and one of the things that uh, really excited me when I was the Disabilities Minister uh, was that uh, people who are NDIS participants would be able to take their NDIS package and uh, direct it uh, to, um, to the arts, uh, to their personal involvement in the arts, if that's something that they chose to do. And just near where I live in Melbourne uh, is a great organisation called Studio Arts, um, who are a visual, visual arts um, organisation uh, who, who do, do great stuff. Uh, so uh, absolutely, uh, people should be able to direct part of their NDIS package uh, to uh, participating. Uh, in the arts because the NDIS is all about supporting individuals uh, with a disability to be full, fully included and fully participating in, in the community. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll have a chat to, uh, to, to Jane Prentice. And just in terms of the structure of the NDIS, um, it's a joint responsibility of the state governments and the Commonwealth governments. So the governing, um, the governing body for it is the COAG uh, ministerial Council, which is made up of Commonwealth and state disabilities ministers, uh, so it's a it's a shared venture, uh, but uh, it's a it's a good prompt for us uh, to talk to our colleagues who have responsibility for the NDIS now. Thank you very much. I do agree with the um, with, um, the NDIS philosophy that it's actually um, going to cut. Jane Prentice has been invited. I haven't heard yet to open up undercover artists festival at Queensland Theatre on the thirty. So I hope she may be able to come. Right. Thanks, Pat. Excellent. That's Thank great. You. All right, folks, um, I know we could be here for many hours and um, there's lots that you'd like to share, but I'd really love to invite uh, Catherine to um, close things off and, and wrap things up as, uh, as chair of the chamber. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, I'm Catherine Hepper. I'm the general manager of Love White Theatre Company, but here today I'm representing the Queensland Chamber of Arts and Culture. The Chamber is an independent voice for the arts in Queensland and was formed in 2015 in response to the need for unified advocacy across the arts sector. I'd like to thank Uncle Bob Anderson for his welcome to country earlier and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Jagger and the Turrbal people, pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that all the artists in the room and the artists online make work on lands that have been a place of storytelling and art making for tens of thousands of years. And that impacts and informs all we do and makes for a rich cultural and artistic community here in Queensland. On behalf of the Chamber and the Brisbane Powerhouse and the industry here today and online, I'd like to thank you, Minister, for taking the time to meet with the Queensland arts sector today, for taking our questions and listening to the concerns and priorities we have as a sector. Uh, Trevor, thank you for being here today as well and for helping facilitate uh, this, this meeting, which I think is a, a bit of a one-off around the country. So we're really pleased to have been able to do that. Uh, thank you to the powerhouse, to Chris and Fiona for hosting today and for Scotia who managed our online participants. And thank you to everyone who's come here today to be part of this. It's vital that we all are present and turn up and especially the people in regional Queensland who have been part of, part of the conversation today through our online portal. Certainly the discussion... Yeah, tell us where they're from. Sunshine Coast. 
Moreton Bay, Redcliffe and various others. Great, thank you. Certainly the discussion today has backed up the results of the Chamber's recent sector survey where issues of high importance included the development of a long-term funded strategy for regional arts activities, which includes significantly increased investment, increased investment in Queensland First Nations artists and culture to acknowledge their unique contribution to the state, and increased investment in and strategic support for young people in the arts companies and programs in Queensland. Growing the pool of funding across all levels of government, strategy and investment from all levels of government to ensure sustainable careers for artists in Queensland will benefit everybody. To everyone here today, I would encourage you to join the Chamber through our website, which I think is up here, or through our Facebook. We'll be continuing our advocacy for increased investment in the arts and equitable access for all Queenslanders in the lead up to the state election. We'll call on all parties to develop and share their arts and cultural policy at a pre-election debate. So please keep an eye out when the, when the election's called, check out our Facebook, our website, and you'll see where all the activity is going to happen. I hope you all join the Chamber so that we can be truly representative of the sector. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Join us for afternoon tea on the terrace next door. Okay, guys, we're going to get um, Mitch over here to the computer before he leaves the room. So hang in there. Um, Uh, they're just taking his mic off and I'm going to drag him across here. Okay, so this is the camera here. So, um, Senator Firefield is here now. Can you hear that? So, he's just got a couple of minutes. If you, anyone wants to have a chat, you just remember to have to unmute. Hey, guys. Thanks uh, very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all when we have our first uh, regional um, arts conference. Thanks, Senator. That was a very fabulous option. Uh, Sonia Cousins from Moreton Bay Regional Council, and I'm a professional screenwriter and filmmaker. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Um, a quick question from me is that um, I really love the way that you uh, shared my vision for a seamless integration of the arts into society and the, the greater commercial business and social sectors. And I think in order to achieve such a thing, um, a long-term education program would be um, a great directive um, to potentially introduce on the federal level. Um, for example, I was at a talk where uh, the health insurance fund Bupa were employing artists to introduce that creative mindset to their, um, you know, commercial industry. And it's that type of acceptance of really blending the arts into uh, whether it be, as I said, commercial, residential, business or social sectors that I think creates a deeper acceptance and therefore in the long term sustainability. Is this um, the type of education program that you would think could be of benefit and potentially um, invest in? No, but it sounds like a, a good idea. Sorry, if, I, if I'm talking sadly, it's because I'm getting myself in um, repeat in my ear. 
you know that sorry i'll just take my earpiece out because you know when you get feedback loop in your in your ear sorry uh, yes. but i think it's a, i think it's a good idea um there is a role absolutely for for, for corporates to, to play um and i think a number of corporates are um, increasingly embracing and recognising that uh, they they can play a role in the arts, but I, I like the idea of a of a national education campaign. Excellent, thank you. Perhaps Melissa, you want to follow up that that last comment about the regional gathering? Uh, thank you, and again, thank you, Minister, for your great words. Uh, we. We're really serious about trying to get this model right for the regional delivery and it's very challenging without all of the pieces of the pie sitting at the table at the same time in the, par the partnership. So it, it absolutely not to direct anybody to do anything. We're actually wanting to collaborate right across all levels of government and the stakeholders and us that are regionally based and understand regionally determined program. And uh, we just feel like it um, would be a really useful time and amazing to get no, that right yeah i think that'd be great and um you know kate fielding would probably be a terrific person to uh, to chair it for us oh absolutely and regional arts australia have been holding back they've been waiting for the state for the same reason like yourself they've told us very clearly that they w they need to wait for direction from the state but the state are only a quarter of the pie as as we see it so yeah, for sure. Kate would be great. No, great. Uh, good, good to see you again, Melissa. Yeah, you too. So maybe unless there any last quick, there's a whole room of people here as well. So does anyone have a last comment? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't mind. It's Sue Davis here. So I'm also working education. I think um, in terms of supporting the arts and engagement with the arts for children and young people, really looking at um, support for artists in schools and also supporting, um, for example, primary specialists in the arts in schools would be great to come from um, the arts portfolio as well. And I think some of those programs, community partnerships programs were, uh, with you know, artists working in schools, those haven't been funded uh, in the same degree as they were previously. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Look, I, I think that that that's something that should definitely happen. Um, it, it is something that really should be part of the core business of um, the state education system. I mean, you know, when, when a number of us were growing up, uh, there were healthy um, arts programs uh, in the schools. Uh, that's something that's really fallen by the wayside. Uh, so, you know, it's something I'm all for, but I really think that the, the states do need to, to step up to the plate uh, with that. Uh, what about the community partnerships funding for the artists in schools initiatives? I believe that was previously funded by partnership from OSCO within the state government agencies. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not um, not against uh, there being a, an OSCO involvement, but there, there would definitely need to be a state involvement as well. And I, I guess why I mentioned the states is because I, I think it's some, you know, arts education is something that should be a core part of the curriculum um, anyway. Uh, but uh, look, you know, we, we have made some contributions in, in the past. Uh, the Commonwealth has made some contributions, for instance, to uh, an organisation called The Song Room, which is a not-for-profit that uh, helps the schools set up their own um, their own music program. So, yes, we have had an involvement. I'm not against just having a further involvement, but just really keen for the states to see this as part of the, the, the core business of, uh, of education. Thank so you. maybe that can be a part of the conversation with that collective roundtable. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Rich. No worries. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, great that uh, great that you could join us today. Ciao. Okay, here you go. He's going off to have a cup of tea. So thank you, everyone, for coming online. It's been great. It was really great, and I think a good presence in the room here today. So well done for making the effort. Thanks so much, Scotia.
Yep. So we we have recorded the sessions, uh, Thanks, um, Gosha. and I'll put it out uh, as a MP3 once we've got some clearance. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Gosha. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. See Hi, everyone. Bye. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I only just got my face on, but I've been here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're at the beach. What a I nice am. way to have a forum. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> sand gate. Yeah, yeah. See, this is the beauty that is. Yeah. Look fabulous on stream. <laughs> oh, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Well, at least everyone's right. dressed. Not, not in your pajamas still. Well, you haven't seen the bottom half of me. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, get better there. And um, thank you all again for, for joining in. And if you haven't joined the chamber, jump online and make sure you do. Thanks, Kim. Send my love to everyone there. Okay, bye. Bye.